Hello, I'm Stephanie Ruff. And I'm Aviva Nabeski. We're the hosts of the Dressage Today podcast, where you can find us talking about anything and everything dressage related. Our conversations span the world of dressage from leading riders to local level dressage heroes. We're talking training advice, showing tips, and sharing stories to inspire your own dressage journey. So tune in, then tack up. Welcome to another edition of the Dressage Today podcast, sponsored by Purina Animal Nutrition. Today, we'll be talking to young horse expert, Alice Tarjan. But first, time is getting short. And the pace has quickened for the march to the Maccabi. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, so I know that we won't go live right away, but today while we're recording, we are about three weeks out from when I leave. And it is starting to feel as if maybe it might be real. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's getting close. So yesterday I got a UPS box and it had... Um, I call it swag. Yeah. It had some polo shirts and some t-shirts and a hoodie and pants and shorts and a hat and pins and, you know, all the stuff that I'm supposed to wear for the opening ceremonies and things like that. So, Fun. Yeah, so I'm official. Yeah, you are. So that's, that's kind of exciting. It and is. Um, I've been doing a whole lot of judging lately and, you know, squeezing everything in before I leave. And it's so funny because people I don't know, come down center line and, you know, do their final halt and they come up and I go to say something and they say, Hey, good luck in Israel. <laughs> and I think, I don't know who you are, but thank you. <laughs> so it's, it truly has captured everybody's imagination. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're getting close. Um, we have four horses lined up for us to try to see, you know, what, what meshes best with us. And um, there is a show jumping team and there are three riders on the show jumping team. So we'll be sort of hanging out with them as well. They compete the same day we do. And now it's just a matter of hammering down the packing, which is still really scaring <laughs> me. Um, but getting that taken care of and getting to Israel and getting my SIM card installed in my phone and figuring out who my roomie is and what horse I'm going to be riding and how many countries are going to be competing in dressage. And it's just still all very sort of yeah. nebulous and out there, but still really exciting. Yeah. Oh, it is. Definitely. So I'm hoping that I I will have this SIM card and I will hopefully be able to post stuff on Facebook and to be able to WhatsApp to you and let you know what's going on and give you updates. Um, they are still talking about live streaming, but no details yet how that's going to work. Okay. And I do know that we compete on the 18th and the 19th. And I believe that we ride at... 6 p.m. Israel time, um, both days. And then the individual championships are on the 21st. And because I'm not expecting to be in the top for that, I haven't memorized the time or anything yet. So. Oh, well, you know, be prepared. <laughs> you never know. Well, I actually I have to admit, I printed out the test today and I am going to ride it at a schooling show because it's okay. the FEI junior team test. And for any of you who want to go take a look at it, wow, is it complicated? <laughs> um, you know, third two and third three, you know, I can figure those out. They make sense to me. There's flow. I have them memorized. But this team test is wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, Yeah. So okay. I better start thinking about it. Yeah, at least think about it. Doesn't hurt to think about it. No, because, you know, it's <laughs> FEI rules, which means that I can have a reader. So I really right. better learn it. So yes, that's, really that's my goal for the next couple of weeks is to learn yet a third test and have that in, <laughs> in my brain. So wish me luck, everybody. And um, oh, well, we we're do. getting close. Yeah. Now, do you know how many hours ahead Israel is from us on the or I should say from people from the East Coast? I want to say it's eight hours. Okay. It's seven, eight, or nine. I can Google it really quickly. Well, no, that's okay. <laughs> we, can, we don't need to. <laughs> we'll find out, especially if it live streams. We'll make sure to put the information out there. 
so that people have it because that would be fun. Well, okay, I have it. It's nine nine forty one in Israel, and it's two forty one here, so it's seven, seven hours, hours. Ahead of Eastern time. Yeah. Okay. There we go. And you said right. what time did you say we were you were going I think, to? I'm pretty sure it's six p.m. is when we start. It's all at, no, I think okay. it's seven. I lied. I think it's seven. Oh my God! Does see how stressed I am? <laughs> this is so embarrassing. Well, sent you all this stuff, and I can't keep track of it because I'm just so freaked out. That's okay. You'll, it's you'll know. It, yeah, it's it's evening. I do know that it's evening. Right, it's evening there. Okay, so good yeah. deal. All right. Yeah. Well, we do all wish you well. And Thank you. Hopefully, it would be great if it was live streamed and we'd be able to watch you. Oh, that's kind of intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that would be the least of your concerns at that point, I think. <laughs> I, I think you're right. I, I yeah. Okay, so I just pulled it up. They see, here's my schedule. The open dressage starts at seven. I was totally wrong. Seven thirty p.m. <laughs> on the eighteenth, and it starts at. See, it's it's in it's in twenty four hundred twenty four hour clock. Right. So that's confusing to me. And it starts at eight o'clock okay. on the nineteenth. Okay. Okay. Well, definitely, if there is live streaming, we will put that out there on our social media. And uh, to to let people know how they can watch and when they can watch. Sounds good. And apparently the show jumping starts before hours. So they start for those of you who are interested in watching the show jumping. They start at 5 p.m. on the 18th and they start at 4 p.m. on the 19th. OK. So they're a little bit earlier. So that's everything I know. All right. And obviously, I don't know very much, and I'm not very good at retaining it. <laughs> I think I've gone into stress mode now. Oh, it'll be fun. You're going to have it is fun. Be fun. It, it is. It is. I, I found out that, you know, the first week that we're there, we're, we're mostly doing traveling and, and, you know, sightseeing and things. And we're on a tight schedule and we train in the morning. And it sounds like our training starts at six o'clock in the morning there you go which means you know we're getting up at four thirty, five o'clock yep so oh, i don't think i'm going to be anyway. doing any he- i don't think i'm doing any heavy duty partying in Israel. okay <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway so i will keep in touch with you i will let you know what's going on and as i find things out i will i will pass it along and for those of you who are interested You'll have the information almost as quickly as I do. Okay. Good deal. All righty. So this month, our Ask the L question comes from Bobby. And on the surface, it's a simple one. What is the one piece of advice, whether that be for horse, rider, training, etc., you wish you knew when you first started out in dressage? Well, you know, as you said, on the surface, this looks like a very sort of straightforward, easy to answer question. And it really isn't. You know, again, full disclosure, I I saw this question two days ago. So I've been mulling it for two days. And I, I have to say, my answer is probably not what Bobby is looking for. (laughs) Um, But this is my answer. My answer is a very simple one. And it is, I wish I had known that it was okay to be bad in order to learn. Right. Because I think so many of us do things that we're innately good at. And Riding is not something that all of us are innately good at. You know, when I was growing up, I was a musician and I was really good. And I was a public speaker and I was really good. And I was a writer and I was really good. But I didn't play sports because I'm a klutz (laughs) and I wasn't really good. And I didn't dance because I'm a klutz and I was awkward. And I never did things that I wasn't good at. And then at 32, I decided to try horseback riding. And you know what? I wasn't really good. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it's the only thing that I'm not very good at that I have continued to do. 
Um, and so I technically am a professional because I teach, but I will never be as good as lots of the pros out there, any of the pros out there and many of the amateurs out there because I just started too late. And I wish that I had known when I started that I didn't have to have the lofty goals that I thought that I did and that I could have spent a little bit more time embracing the suck (laughs) and (laughs) laughing at myself and undoing the learning instead of putting pressure on myself and beating myself up and, you know, tied in with that. I think the same thing is true for our horses. You know, our horses don't have a stake in the game. Our horses just want to do what's easiest for them and they want to make us happy and they don't care if they get ribbons and they don't care if they go to the Olympics and, you know, they just want to make us happy and, 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 you know, get treats and, you know, be loved on and all the rest of it. And we need to remember that and be patient with them and give them time to be bad at stuff too, before they learn how to do it. And I wish that I had known that some take, sometimes it takes longer than other times. And some of us learn more quickly than others. And some things learn, some of us learn things really fast, but learn other things really slowly And the same is true with our horses. And so I wish I had known just how individual we all are on this journey and that that's okay. And not only is our journey individual, but our goals are individual. And we need to give everybody just a little bit of grace in this process. Yeah, I would agree with that a thousand percent. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I just I think about people that I know who are my peers, you know, technically my peers as riders, and they get things so much more quickly than I do, and they get better scores and you know, all of that. And I beat myself up and then I have to remind myself that, you know, I'm on a different journey. I'm on a different journey, I'm on a different horse. Yeah. Um, I have different goals. And my journey is my own and it's unique to me. And I need to be proud of what I have accomplished and proud of what my horses have accomplished and not compare my horses to other people's horses and not compare myself to other people. Because that's the thing that makes us crazy. It is. It is. And it is much easier said than done. Oh, God. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. But the the common saying is dressage is a journey, but you are completely correct and it's a very individual journey um but it is it it is hard to not compare yourself or your horse or your situation or anything yeah. else but you are completely correct we are all well you know it's funny i i follow the galloping housewife on facebook um and she posted something that i saw today that she had decided to try eventing you know this is a woman who was go was was trying out for the olympics in dressage and she said i knew i wasn't going to be any good and i just wanted to have fun and so she talks about she isn't any good at it but it's fun right and and her goal is fun not to go win yeah not to qualify for the olympics but to go have fun and remember why she rides yeah And I I think that that's just so important for us all to remember the reason that we first got involved in riding wasn't to go to the Olympics, wasn't to get a a bronze medal, wasn't to hear, you know, A, enter collective trot (laughs) for the first time, but it was because we loved the horses and we wanted to be, you know, harmonious with our horses and to be able to remember that um, and start enjoying it again. I think is so important. And I think this is something I've talked about before. Yeah. Um, And obviously the fact that I keep talking about it must mean that I'm really (laughs) trying to embrace the suck and, you know, embrace this, this idea. Cause as you said, it's really easy to say the words, but it's very hard to internalize. Yeah. Um, But I think that we'll all be a lot happier. And I think our horses will all be a lot happier and a lot you know, sounder and stronger and joyful if we can all just remember that this is supposed to be fun 
And yeah. it's going to take as long as it takes. And maybe you're not going to get where you want to go, but isn't it fun trying to get there? Exactly. Yeah. And I think the other thing that especially I think dressage riders tend to do is you don't look at how far you've come because we're always in dressage. There's always like that next level. There's that next test. There's that next level. There's that next yes. movement. So you're always looking at what's next, what's next, what's next. And you forget to look at, and and so you're always kind of challenging yourself and you're like, well, I'm not good at this. I'm not good. But you forget to look back at yourself, you know, three months ago or six months ago or a couple yeah. of years ago and realize, okay, six months ago, I couldn't, you know, Whatever. enter a 10 meter circle or something. Right. Um, and now I can, it's not perfect, but now I can, you know, yeah. we don't look, we don't give ourselves enough credit looking back at how far we've come. We're constantly looking at what we still need to do. Yeah. And, and that makes us feel bad about ourselves as well, because, you know, we're like, well, I can't do that yet. That's something else I try to remind myself from time yeah. to time, you know, no, that like, well, think about what you used to not be able to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I mean, every it, it's wonderful if you can get some videotape of stuff. And, you know, right. I, I, you know, the every I, I, I had a little breakthrough with Tiger a couple of weeks ago, and I'm laughing about it because, you know, I, I said to I said to my trainer, I wish I could be my own trainer sometimes because I'm such an idiot and I can tell, uh, I can tell my students stuff. <laughs> I, I forget. So I've been really struggling with, even though he has really expressive, really easy changes, I've been having trouble with his flying changes. And I had this major revelation the other day that when you do the half halt for the flying change, you have to use the reins. It's not just your leg and your seat. Yeah. You actually give a rain aid as well. And I know that. <laughs> but somehow um, it short circuited in my brain sitting on my own horse. And so a month ago, my flying changes were, you know, a wing and a prayer. And now my changes have gotten really nicely on the aids and expressive because now I'm actually riding them correctly. There you go. So, you know, remembering those things sometimes is important that yeah. a month ago I couldn't do this. And yes, it's because I'm an idiot, but still a month ago it wasn't there and today it is. So, you know, giving yourself permission to recognize your progress is important too. Yes, it definitely is. So, so everyone out there, take a look at where you've been. Take a look at where you are and then take a look at where you're going, but not where everybody else is going. Good advice. Yes. Attention horse owners. Are you looking to help your horse recover with ease after a strenuous workout? Would you like to nourish your horse and their digestive system? If so, try the new Purina Replenimash product. It's much more than a mash. Replenimash promotes hydration, replenishes electrolytes, and supports gastric comfort. Put Purina's research to the test. Stop into your local Purina retailer and grab a bag of Purina Replenimash product. A New Jersey native, Alice Tarjan spent her early days riding in Pony Club and moved on to eventing before focusing on dressage. A Seton Hall Law School graduate and cancer survivor, Alice steadily moved up the ranks in dressage, competing as an amateur against some of the best professionals in the world. Alice has gained a reputation of buying young horses and bringing them along to Grand Prix. In 2019, she won the Grand Prix and Grand Prix Freestyle in the Adult Amateur Division at U.S. Dressage Finals presented by Adequan and USDF with the Hanoverian Mayor, Candescent. In 2020, she took home multiple titles from the U.S. Dressage Festival of Champions, including the Markel USEF Developing Horse Grand Prix Dressage National Championship with her Oldenburg mare, Donatella M. This year, she and the mare Serenade MF were named to the Dutta Corp U.S. Dressage Team for the FEI Dressage Nations Cup, the Netherlands, CDI 05 star. So I want to thank you, Alice, for taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. 
So just to get started, um, how did you get your start in horses and in dressage? I think maybe it was like fourth grade and I just kind of caught the horse crazy bug and wanted to ride everything I could get my hands on. So did that and went through pony club and really kind of fell in love with eventing and started eventing, I guess, through high school. And then I got a, I guess, a thoroughbred in high school. And that was basically a very green broke. And somebody said to my mother, you know, she should go take some dressage lessons before you let her go jump that horse. So I went and was a working student for a dressage trainer. And I saw the horse, I saw the trainer one day riding a dressage horse, you know, and of course before that was before like you had like the internet, right? And yeah, like, funny videos or stuff. Yeah. And then, so, so I watched it. I go with an upper level horse and I just, I was completely amazed that you could actually like train a horse to move like that and to, <laughs> and to do the movements. Cause I'd never seen it before. Like, you know, for pony club, it was like, dressage is always like, how slow and boring could you make your horse go and make the perfect circle? And that was so boring. Like, who wants to do that? Of course, you want to go out and jump. But after I saw that, saw that, it was like, oh, my God, like, that's what I want to do. So I eventually through college, and then I kind of, and then I went to law school, and then I went to dressage, basically. So you just you just kind of fell in love with the, the dressage portion of it? Yeah, I think it was the idea that you can... You can train the horse like to do the movements and you can also train the gates and that I think it's more of a communication and a conversation between you and the horse and like jumping is. Yeah. I, think, I mean, I think, you know, when you jump, like you need an athletic horse and, and you train it to like, you know, jump through the flags basically. And <laughs> of course there's much more to it than that, but <laughs> I think, I think that you know, with dressage, it's much more of like a constant conversation with the horse to, to, to train all the movements and you know, to get it through a test effectively. Um, yeah, like you can just you can tell, right? Like you 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 can like Grand Prix, like you know, jumpers can go and buy a new horse, and, and they'll be showing it in the Grand Prix, like you know, like two weeks after, right? right. And you never see that in dressage, or if they do it in dressage, it's never very successful. Mm-hmm. So it's much more about the partnership and the communication between horse and rider than it is about just like pure athleticism. I think so. Right. I, I really in, in, the, in the training, and I enjoy the training of the horses. So. For me, that was what it was all about. Yeah. So who have been your mentors or other people that have influenced your riding? Oh, wow. I've trained with so many people. Um, but I think that that's what's important, right? Because I think that you have to take a bunch of different ideas and then and then build them together and then figure out what works for you individually, right? right. And yeah. Yeah. So I've learned from so many people and they give you different ideas and, and then you're like, oh, like, Something has a have a horse and I'll be like, I have this problem with this horse. And I'll be like, oh, I'll go to that person because they're good at, you know, explaining this problem or that person is good for this problem. So I just think it's a conglomeration at this point of so many people, you know, so like I'm training with Marcus Orlov, you know, pretty consistently now. Um, well, I guess basically daily. And then, but then like, so I worked with um, Debbie McDonald this winter and I've worked with Lars Peterson for probably almost 10 years, I would say. And I've worked with Martin Thompson and I've worked with Catherine Hattad. So I worked with, and, and, you know, I've done you know, certainly lots of clinics with other people. So, yeah. And, and then and it's not to say like what you don't learn just from, from watching too. Right. Like I learned so much from like watching the, the horse shows and even like, you know, like put my horse in, in the competitions over in Europe. Yeah. So, yeah, I really think it's just, it's, you gain so much from so many people and then it's your right. job to, to try to find how that helps you with, with each individual horse and yeah. you know, what, what you're presented at that time. Yeah. No, I like that. It's kind of a melting pot of everything. <laughs> it is, it's, it, but that's exactly what it is. Yes. <laughs> to your to your career, this to this point, what have been some of your most memorable or favorite moments? I'm not really very competition focused. Like, I, I mean, I guess like on paper, like you know, we made the shortlist for the Olympics last year. And yeah. We made the shortlist for the World Championships this year, so certainly on paper, that's the biggest. But I think. For me, it's just, it's the ability to train a horse and know that, like, you know, my first Grand Prix horse and I was ready to get retired. And then you're like, wow, like, that's horrible. You know, like, you're so, like, oh, I'm so sad because I'm never going to have another Grand Prix horse because, huh, you know, like, <laughs> this one's so special. I could make this one. And, and, and at that point, I already had two five year olds going. And then I was like, wait, like, the five year olds already had their pee off started and the flying change started. And it, granted, it's super green, but I was like, oh, like, I can do this again. Like, this isn't a big deal. Like, and, and then you figure out, like, no, like, this is just, it's like, it's so, like, I don't want to say it's easy. It's not, but it's just like, at this point for me, it's just routine. Like I, I, I buy a full or a three-year-old and by the time it's eight, it does it basically the entire round break. Maybe it's green, but, but that you can just do this over and over and over. And it's not that exciting or special. It's just, but you just work and that's what it, that's how it happens. And so for me personally, like I, I I'm concentrating much more on the training than yeah. the, like than trying to make goals for horse shows. I think that that's kind of setting yourself up for disappointment to a large extent because, 
those things to a large extent, I think you can't control. Right. Um, so I think I can control it, you know, try, I, I want to keep my horses happy and the work and, you know, sound and their minds and their bodies and enjoying it and train them up the levels um, as effectively as I can. And beyond that, like, yeah, and then you put them in the show ring to keep yourself honest about how good it actually is and how much they are actually honestly on the aids. But then how they do or not is sort of irrelevant to some extent, right? I mean, <laughs> lots of times you go in and you do a test and you're like, that was horrible and you win. And they're like, aren't you so happy you won? And I'm like, well, I'm happy I won, but it wasn't really very good. I mean, right. we got a lot of homework to do, obviously. And, right. and lots of times you go in and, and, and you're like, wow, that was fantastic. And like, okay, like maybe it was strong competition. Maybe somebody's better that day. And you, know, you don't win. You're like, I've never been like, like I think last year we finished six at the section trials. It's like, wow, like I've never been happier to finish six in my life. Like that horse put in a fantastic test. Like that horse was like completely with me that test basically. Like that was a first for that horse. That was such a huge accomplishment that it actually stayed with me for the test, you know? Yeah. So for me, like that's what's more exciting than, than what, what the papers say. Right. Right. Yeah. It's sometimes, yeah. We talk a lot about how dressage is such an individual sport and it's your individual accomplishments on the journey you're on which could be very but really, different. But that's so much the truth. Yeah. Like it really is. It, it, and, and, and everything's relative, right? I mean, everybody's in a different position. Right. Right? Everybody has a different ability and a, and a different you know, commitment and, you know, different physical abilities and different financial abilities. And, you know, right. So it, everybody's on their own journey. And I don't, and I think to compare yourself to others, is just, it's foolish. There's always going to be somebody who's going to do better than you. Like, yeah. Unless you're Isabel, and basically unless you're Isabel Worth and people still be her, like there's always somebody who's going to be better at some point. You're never going to be the best every day. Right. So if your goal is to be the best, like I just think, well, then you're going to be sad the entire life. Basically. <laughs> like, you know, like my goal is to try to train my horses as well as I can and to try to, you know, you know, have them play with me in the test as much as I can. And beyond that, I, you can't, I have no control over the rest of it. So why be concerned about it? Right. Exactly. So then kind of along those lines, what do you find the most challenging about the sport? The challenge is that all the horses have different strengths and weaknesses, right? So your your job is to try to figure out how to best explain to the horse, you know, how you want it to go and to try to strengthen their weaknesses as much as you can and then highlight their strengths. So it's so it's very individualized, right? It yeah. really depends on the horse. And, and I think so the idea is that you go out every day and and you try to do the best you can. And at the end of the day, then, then I try to, you know, like, you know, all I dream about is like, you know, like, you know, what ride did I give which horse? And, you know, like, okay, that that horse didn't understand what I was asking. And, okay, I should have stopped and I should have asked this way instead. Or I could represent the problem that way. And, like, how, you know, how can I try to explain to the horse what, what reaction I wanted to have, right? Like, you know, the horses are all pretty honest, so Yeah. They're sort of like computers, like, but, you know, yeah. but a little, a little bit different. Right. But like, you kind of like, like whatever they give you is what they think they're supposed to give you. Right. right? Like horses, right. like 99% of them want to take the path of least resistance. Yeah. So if, if they're giving you something, then that's what they think they're supposed to be doing. And it's your job to figure out, like, if that's not what you want the horse to be doing, then it's your job to figure out how to explain to it what you, what you do want it to do. Right. So yeah. I think that's just like on a, on a minute by minute basis, riding the horses is trying to ride smart and, and effectively and, and sympathetically and, and figure out, you know, from the horse's perspective, like how it's understanding your aids and how, and how you need to put different aids on to get a different result per se. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but you're definitely known for bringing young horses up through the ranks to Grand Prix. You did mention that a lot of you buy young horses. So what do you look for when you're evaluating a young horse? Okay, so so I buy a lot of full. I, I buy some foals, and and I think that buying foals is evaluating foals. I think is pretty difficult to be honest. Yeah, I have to figure it out. And I think and I think you know you can you can get some idea from the bloodlines. I think that helps, and you can see have some idea from you know, looking at the foal itself, right? Like, but I also think that lots of times you know you have a foal that looks very promising, and as a you know an adult horse under saddle, it's not is it you know, promising as you'd hoped. Right. And, and you can see this all the time, like, because you, you, you watch prices, of, you know, bulls going through auctions, and plenty of times the high sellers don't end up actually being that exciting, right, when, they, when they're three or four. And then, so, yeah. and, right, and sometimes the cheap ones, you know, you stand under saddle at three or four, you're like, wow, like, that's a fantastic horse. Like, and it was kind of disappointing as a full, right? <laughs> so, so I think, but but I guess the goal for me is you, you just buy enough of them, and then hopefully some of them end up being super. And, and, and then, okay, so then when you, if you buy, like, a two- or three-year-old, you have a better idea about what the what the horse is going to look like under saddle, right? Like, if it's two, it's not under saddle yet, and if it's three, then they're under saddle. But, of course, then the price is goes way up if they're good, yeah. right? So then you got to pay more money. Um, but what I've also learned is 
is how much training can affect the horse. So, okay, for sh- like, I think that you can take like basically a donkey and teach it and teach it how to move better than it does naturally. And you could probably teach it the whole Grand Prix if you wanted to. Now, I wouldn't personally want to do that because I don't. To me, it's kind of a waste of time. Like, what's the point? But but if somebody wanted to do that, God bless them. That's awesome, and I'll cheer you on to do it. Like that, that's great. Um, but but I think that you can drastically change, you know, the horse's way of going, right? Just as much as you can train them the movement. So. I've had plenty of horses actually that I've started that I bought as foals and then started and, and been really pretty disappointed actually with what they look like. And I was like, Oh geez, like, you know, this one's not as exciting as I'd hoped. Yeah. And the more they train up, then you, then you start getting more and more excited about them. And, you know, and then you're like, wow, like this is a really fantastic <laughs> horse, but you wouldn't know if you had to put a year or two of training into them. Right. So yes, ideally you, you want a horse, you know, that's uphill. I don't like terribly long backs. Um, you know, you want a nice top line on them. I want them to articulate their joints. You, you hopefully want them to you know be rideable, but a lot of these things can be trained. So, like I said, I think you could train a donkey. Now, a donkey's <laughs> never going to go as well as is as, as, as some you know super athletic, scopey, warm blood. Of course, so, and I'm not saying it would, but but it's going to go a lot better than it started at, right? And right. yeah, so I look for, I, certainly I look for a certain type. But like I said, but I can't tell you how many times I've been surprised. <laughs> um, so. So I really just think ultimately, like if I, it, I, I like the horse that I'm, I'm on the, you know, I'm over here at Europe right now, like Serenade, like I bought her as a full and as a three-year-old, I, I would have given the horse away. It was <laughs> like, oh my God, this is like some downhill hunter. Like what, like, wow. Like I was like, I could have given it away. I'm like, all right, we'll just try to get moving a little bit and try to sell it and I can move on. And, and then, and then we, so it's like, okay, so we're going to train it a little bit so I can get some money for it. And the more you train it, the better it got. And then you're like, wow, like the horse moves like a freak. It's a fantastic <laughs> horse. Right. So but that's not how it started. So, yeah, they surprise you. I, yeah. Get a horse in it, and then I think you got to stick with it and train it for a while and see what you got, right? Like, because a lot, a lot can change. And that actually, I was going to ask you what advice you might give, but that might be your your advice. <laughs> well, yeah, because how much you can influence with training. I think that people look at me and they're like, oh, she just goes buys these like super fancy young horses and she wants to spend a lot of money and, and they move like freaks from the time she buys them. And that's not the reality of the yeah. matter, right? Like, like I said, like I bought foals and you buy or two or three year olds, and yes, some of them, some of them you pay more money for, and they're already moving better. But lots of them I didn't, and or they started off as foals, and you're really disappointed with them. But <laughs> but then you train them a little bit, and then and they turn into fantastic animals. I you just as much as you can train a horse to do like the Grand Prix movements, right? Like the half pass and to pee off and massage and to do a pirouette and the flying changes. You can train them how to walk, trot, and canter. Like you can train the gates, yeah. And I think that that's something that a lot of people miss is that it's not just about teaching a horse to like leg yield, you know, when, when you know they're four or five or to, you know, be on the bit. It's about training the horse how to carry themselves and how to be, a, you know, electric off the aids, right? right? Like that's, that, that is trained just as much as, as how to do a leg yield or a lengthening is trained. Yeah. And if you train, if you train both parts, okay, then you end up with a, with a much more competitive horse than if you were just simply training you know, the the movements on a horse. Right. Definitely. So in the last couple of years, you've had a lot of success with mares and Mm -hmm. do you, do you enjoy riding mares? It's really simply, I I have mares and I also, we have a couple of stallions as well. Right. And honestly, it's, it's because I figure if they break, I can always find home to them as a broodmare and I don't really want to have a lame gelding, you know, that that's, you know, a pasture style gelding. Like, what are you going to do with that? It's kind of useless. But if I have, if I have a mare and it's well-bred, and it's got a good show record. Um, I know that I can find a home for it. Yeah. That being said, I, I've I've learned to like. There's a whole science in keeping your horses sound, and I'm really really lucky now. So I, they they stay sound, so it's not a problem. So right. No, I I don't have any foals for my own horses anymore. Which I guess is a good thing because they're all in for it. Right? They're all, but that's they're why all I have there. And, and 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 I don't and. And I know that people are like, oh, they don't like mares and they're witchy or what. Like, I've never, I, I can't tell you how many mares I've had and I've really never had a problem. I mean, yes, yeah, some of them are, you know, more squealy than others, but under saddle, they all work and it doesn't matter if they're in season or not. Like, you don't know, like they work and that's their job and that's what they do. Um, right. And I don't, I couldn't tell you what it's like to ride a gelding because I don't, I mean, the one gelding I have is my fox hunter. <laughs> and he's fine, but <laughs> I, I don't ride gelding for just, I like to tell you about that. And the stallions are, the stallions are fine. Um. You know, there's just that X factor because you got testosterone in the barn, so you got to be careful with the other horses. Do you have a preference for mares or stallions? No, the stallions are just a little bit more on the management side, you know, like, right. yeah, depending on the horse. Of course, you know, some of them are more sturdy than others, but we certainly have two in the barn that are, you know, real studs. And so, I mean, and they're good and you can cross them next to the mares, but you got to be smart with them and you got to, you know, right. you got to know what you're doing, right? Yeah. Like, they're studs, so. Yeah. They're not, they're 
they're sweet. They're lovely horses, but they're, you know, they're stallions. They're, they're you put stallions. American in front of them. They're, they're going to try to breed it. So, course, you know, right. Smart. Right. The, the, yeah. They are, they are who they are. <laughs> yeah. So, so, okay. So you want to go to a horse show and we're bringing mares and stallions. So the stallions, you know, they didn't need the stalls draped and maybe they got to get shipped a little differently or whatever. Right. So, so there's a little bit more complication there just in the management factor. I would say. Right. Yeah. Do you have any particular goals for your horses this year? I really don't set goals. I mean, I guess, you know, loosely, yeah, like we have some, a bunch of them qualified to go to Chicago. Um, I, I, I really just feel like, you know, you train the horses when you think they're ready to go on the ring and to do the tests and you go and you do it. And, and the scores tell you what you're going to do or what you're ready for or not. Like, I, I just think you kind of felt like, you kind of follow where the horse, like what the horse does. If they go on and they do really well and you get the score, you know, and they have super scores, you're like, okay, now, you know, the horse is qualified for Chicago. Fine. Like, that's great. Then that's the next step is you go to Chicago and right. you go on the ring and they're a little green. Well, they're not qualified. You're not going to go. Like, <laughs> I don't think it matters if you say your goal is to go to Chicago or not. What difference does it make? If the horse is going to, and the scores are going to predict it. Yes. Like, I, 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 don't, I'm, I don't ever really understand people saying like, this is my goal. Like, I think my goal is I train the horses as well as I can. And right. you know, when, like I said, when I think they're ready and they're confident and, and you know, the horse show, you know, they're going to be able to go to a show and, and hopefully, you know, you own some of it. Right. And, and you can get them to confidently. Then, then you go and you do that. And then whatever score they got, then the scores are telling you what you're, what you're qualified for or not. <laughs> right. And kind of where, where you're at, <laughs> where you're at. Like, that, like that's the truth. It doesn't, <sighs> I'm not one to, to set goals because I just, I think that you just follow the horses and what they're ready for and the scores tell you what, what they're ready for or not, basically. Right. So it doesn't matter what you want to do or not. <laughs> like, <laughs> the horses set the schedule. <laughs> the horses set the schedule. Like I said, you take a donkey, you train to Grand Prix, that's great. You say you want to go to Paris on it, that's awesome. But but the reality <laughs> of the matter is you're probably not. Like, is it? so what's the point of saying that's your goal? Because yeah. it's, it's unrealistic. Yeah, I'm not one to really set like goals like that, like on paper, like I, like I said, I just, I train the horses and when you think they're ready, you put them in the ring and then the scores tell you where you're going or not. And right. then you just follow the scores basically. Yeah. So the last question I have for you is one that I like to ask everyone and it, and it is, what do you think makes a great horse person? Oh, I think you have to listen to the horses. Like no question. Again, talking about like goals, I think you have to follow the horse. Like you kind of have to let the horse take the lead and and, and listen to the horse and, you know, some things, you know, every horse is an individual and, you know, some, you know, a horse will have its strengths and its weaknesses. And, and like I said, your job is to try to strengthen its weaknesses and to show off its strengths as much as you can. And, and the horses come along, you know, it, it's not that you can't ask the question. So you ask the question, but when they're ready to answer it, they answer it and you can't push any harder to make them answer it any faster. You know, like yeah. when you, when you start to find changes, okay, of course you want a clean straight change. And for some horses that might take, you know, a month or two. And for some terraces, it might take six months. And for some horses, I've had to take a year or two. And it doesn't matter if you're like, my goal is to show up third level. So you need this straight, clean change, like within the next, you know, six months. And it can't take two years. And if the horse isn't ready to give you that answer yet, it's not ready. And it doesn't matter what you do. Like, so you ask the question quietly and eventually they figure it out and they all, they all figure it out in their own time. Right. Yeah. But, but some of them take longer than others and you have to, you just have to wait and quietly ask and, and, They'll, they'll, they'll find it when they do, but it, the same thing is like with the pee off, right? Like, but, but you see so many people that, that wait, I think so long to start asking for a pee off. And then, you know, they have a horse that's a solid St. George I one, like, all right, now we're going to do Grand Prix and we've moved up one level every year. So now we're going to go from I one to I two or Grand Prix. So you need to learn how to pee off and massage in a year. And I start just a very basic little idea of pee massage at five, because I figure it could, it could take six months, but it also could take three or four years. Right. So if I start when they're five, then typically by the time they're eight, they've had more than enough time to process it. I don't have to put any pressure on them to get them to understand it. Yeah. So, so by the time they're eight, they're really confident and happy about it. And I don't have paws up their rear, or they run backwards or they quit, or there's toes, but so much tension about it because they weren't taught it out of tension because there was no timeline. Yeah. Right. And I think that you have to, listen to the horse and like I said when they're ready to answer the question they will but, but and some of them do it faster than others and that's okay but I think to have like timelines and goals and to say you know to the horse like you will be on this timeline and you were going to make these these goals you will go to this show at this level at this time and that's not how they work right like I, so I, I just think I, you gotta listen to the horse and follow the horses is my best advice very good yeah I thank you for taking time out today and um, talking with us. And I want to wish you the very best of luck uh, competing this weekend. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Dressage Today podcast. 
If you've missed any episodes or to subscribe, go to Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. While you're there, please rate and review the show. Learn more and read in-depth training articles at dressagetoday.com, or you can visit our subscription video site, ondemand.dressagetoday.com. Be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. Happy riding, and we'll see you at X. The Dressage Today podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of Equine Network, LLC.